Hey everybody, this is Ryan McClanahan with HistoryThroughCards.com. Hope you're all doing very well today. So recently I picked up a 1959 Barrett Giants and Sports Lester Piggott. And I don't have the card with me, it's still in the mail. <laughs> it's going to be here at some point. It's from England, so it's, it's taking its time. Anyway, uh, I thought that I would share with you the story of Lester Piggott because I think it is really amazing. Uh, he had just passed away, I believe, last year uh, or maybe even this year. I, time, you know, it's anyway. Uh, so uh, let's get into this because it's kind of long and um, I have other things to say outside of this too. So guys, I really think you're going to enjoy this and I'll get you on the flip side. Okay. This is from the independent May 30th, 2022 London, England legendary jockey adored by generations of racing fans by Julian Muscat. The only thing known to millions of people about the sport of horse racing is the name of Lester Piggott to the unversed his was a name on countless betting slips and successive runnings of the Derby. To the housewives, he was the darling of the turf, his bursts of petulance serving only to draw him into their hearts. To the betting shop regulars, he was a source of fascination and frustration, almost in equal measures. And to racing's professionals, he was a unique talent a precious prodigy who triumphed in spite of a series of inborn handicaps. It was not so much in the senses nature kept from him, his inherent partial deafness and the result speech impediment. It was more in what nature gave him in abundance. At five feet seven and a half inches, he stood a towering six inches taller than most of his contemporaries, and at eight and a half stone, he somehow maintained his body weight a full 21 pounds below its natural level and that for 40 years. Quite simply, Lester Piggott was never born with a physical form of a flat race jockey. He developed as a result of the most peculiar riding style of the lot. He always rode with the shortest length of stirrup imaginable, the long legs forcing his backside into the air. You could always tell when he was on a winner, as his rivals abandoned their upright postures for the low crouch of a driving finish. Piggott's motionless silhouette showed up larger still, a squeezing of the knees, a flash of the reins, a flick of the whip, and he was gone. Yet his was a much misunderstood existence from one who was essentially public property from the age of 12. There were some touching moments to go with instances of almost unbelievable rashness and deceit, none more so than his dealings with the inland revenue and customs and excise, which landed him a three-year prison sentence in 1987 and a humiliating withdrawal of the Order of the British Empire accorded him 13 years earlier. His exploits on the racetrack quickly assumed large Portions, the quite breathtaking victories often inspired with tales of infidelity and patrons never before so tolerant of such gross disloyalty. Piggott, for his part, always insisted he had been poached by a rival owner whenever he reneged on a prior commitment. He was never content to ride what he perceived as second best when his favorite mount was available. Give or take the odd, cajoling phone call to the right people, and yet which owner could really afford to be without him in the critical hour? Certainly not John Galbraith, the American property magnate whose horse, Roberto Piggott, had literally forced home by a hair's breadth in the 1972 Derby. Certainly not Robert Strange, whose first derby victory with the minstrel in 1977 was gained in the shadow of the winning post. As the gifted Irish trainer Vincent O'Brien once put it, the worst way to approach the derby was to have Piggott riding against you. All this made up the Piggott psyche. It 
amounted to a fusion of fact, hearsay, and downright fabrication, the latter allowed to run virtually unchecked in the pages of the tabloid press. Given the color of his career, it was fitting he was born in 1935 on November 5th, bonfire night. His father, Keith, rode more than 500 winners over jumps and descended from a racing family noted for its notoriety. One of his forefathers, old John Day, farmed and trained racehorses in Hampshire in the late 18th century. Old John spawned a dynasty that for many years was the talk of the town. Such was the day's propensity for skullduggery, excessive even by the standards of the era. An only child, Piggott was undoubtedly influenced by his mother, Iris Rickaby, whose great-grandfather trained the 1855 derby winner Wild Dayrell. His father, Fred, sent out classic winners himself, and her brother, another Fred, rode classic winners before he was killed in the First World War. Iris's first cousin, Bill Rickaby, was himself a leading jockey until his retirement in 1968. On the face of it, there can be no blood more steeped in racing history. In his early years, Piggott would always sit with his back to the guests, refusing to answer when spoken to. His mother thought nothing of it until the family doctor diagnosed his partial deafness. That he didn't care for strangers was painfully obvious, yet it was only through his ability to lip-read that he was able to communicate at all. So he lived in his own world, cocooned in a land of stables and galloping horses. His disability hampered his school days to the extent that he never passed a single exam in his life. But when his quiet young man, this man of thoroughbred blood, was always destined to take his place on the equine stage. So immersed was he in his insular world that he developed a form of immunity to the emotions predominant in one of his tender years. He was riding out with his father one morning when two fighter planes collided in the air above them. Lester immediately galloped off toward the wreckage ahead of his father who arrived to find him staring impassively at the corpse of a pilot. After a while, he turned and announced the man was dead before calmly walking away. No emotion, no fright, just a matter of fact. He was seven years old. For a few years, he boarded at King Alfred's school in Lamborn, but he became apprenticed to his father in 1948. Later that year, he had ridden his first winter aboard the Chase at Haydock Park, age 12, standing four foot six inches tall and weighing less than five stone. The public immediately took to him, and a nation's love affair with its longest-serving sporting hero was well underway. It later emerged that Piggott and the chase had triumphed at the expense of the favorite prompt corner, only because the latter's trainer told his jockey to stop the horse. He had arrived too late to have a bet, and Piggott later reminisced how, how prompt corner's jockey was screaming him all the way up the home straight. In the next two years, Pickett's riding prowess was firmly established. On his way to the title of champion apprentice in 1950, it also became clear that he was cutthroat as they come. Following three minor suspensions, he was stood down for three weeks for riding with disregard for the safety of other jockeys. Such unbridled ambition caused him problems with senior riders and prompted his cousin, Bill Rickaby, to declare him a menace on the track and preoccupied by money off it. It was only a matter of time before he annexed the biggest part of all, the derby. The moment duly arrived when, age 15, he won the blue ribboned with Never Say Die. However, riding the same horse in the King Edward the seventh stakes at Royal Ascot. Piggott was somewhat harshly judged of dangerous riding, and the stewards, incensed that their numerous warnings had gone unheeded, banned him from riding indefinitely and insisted he move away from his father's stables. 
It was suggested he could reapply for his license after six months. It was Sir Gordon Richards in his twilight years as a jockey who influenced the Ascot stewards into taking an unremitting stance with Piggott. And it was a sign of the times that Sir Gordon's retirement after a nasty fall precipitated Piggott's early return to the saddle. Sir Gordon was retained by the outstanding trainer, Sir Noel Merlis, who subsequently wanted to sign Piggott for riding duties. The way was cleared for Piggott to end his exile in Newmarket, but not before he gave his landlady a poignant demonstration of how he hoarded his money. She returned home one day, pleasantly surprised to find a bunch of flowers in a bowl, only to discover Piggott had subtracted their cost from his weekly board and lodgings. His alliance with Sir Noel Merlis cemented Piggott's position as the country's foremost writer. However, his weight became a constant source of concern, so much so that he had already ridden over jumps where the minimum jockeys are asked to carry is considerably greater than on a flat. He cut his food intake to the bare minimum, leaving himself vulnerable to bouts of depression, but his mind never wavered in its conviction that riding was the only route through life. He would suffer physically for it over the years. The Piggott Merlis team got away to a flying start in 1955. The jockey rode more than a hundred winners for the first time, and the following season he was to forge the first of many glorious partnerships with horses from Merlis's Western Palace stables in Newmarket, owned and bred by Sir Victor Sassoon. Crepello was the first horse off the production line. Crepello's two-year-old season promised much, but Merlis realized from the start, formative of days, that he was a colt with tendon problems. The trainer performed heroics in having Crepello fit enough to land the 2,000 guineas in May, and with Piggott at his calculating best, the combination went on to route the Derby field of 1956. The same year saw Piggott claim the third of five annual classics on the Queen's Carroza in the Oaks, in Sassoon, Piggott had gained a close personal friend. At an early age, Piggott surprised his parents with an interest in the stock market. His daily read was the Financial Times, which he knew backwards. But Sassoon took Piggott's by now considerable financial interests under his wing, and his astute dealings of Piggott's behalf had the 19-year-old glowing with admiration. Such was the friendship between them and Piggott, named his horse Eve Lodge, after Sassoon's own stud farm. When Sassoon died, Piggott never received the same quality of financial advice, and those close to him maintained it, marked the turning point, the moment when Piggott's affairs were to catch up with him with a vengeance. In 1960, Piggott married his childhood sweetheart, Susan Armstrong, daughter of the trainer, Sam. Susan was the perfect match. She, too, was heavily involved with her father's training stables and showed little or no interest in socializing. The year saw Piggott in vintage form through the exploits of St. Patty, who gave Sassoon his fourth victory in the Derby before capturing the St. Ledger, the fifth and final classic. The headstrong St. Patty would have got the better of many a lesser man, but with Piggott, the colt flourished. Although one day at Sandown, St. Patty took his usual fierce hold on the way to start prompting Piggott to point him at one of the steeplechase fences in order to slow him down. This simply encouraged St. Patty to take the obstacle on, forcing his jockey to take swift evasive actions lest Sassoon, in the stands, would turn white with fright. To cap it all, Piggott ended the season as champion jockey for the first time. The Merlis stable maintained its strength in the first half of the 1960s. However, its jockey realized that there were horses trained elsewhere, 
which would be available to him without the shackles of a contract with Merlis. Already he had sensed the developing brilliance of O'Brien, and the restless Piggott was to demonstrate his desire to ride the best available in 1966. O'Brien intended to send Valoris to England for the Oaks, in which the world presumed Piggott would be aboard the Merlis trained Varinia. Piggott duly had his way, and not for the first time. His judgment was immaculate as Valoris swept to vic victory. Incensed, Merlis announced the partnership was over. It was a testament of Piggott's powers of persuasion that he was back on board the Merlis trained Aunt Edith. Seven weeks later, the pair storming to victory in the King George the Sixth and Queen Elizabeth Stakes at Ascot, but the wounds in Merlis's heart never properly healed. He signed George Moore for stable duties in the autumn of 1966, and with Piggott looking on, Merlis dominated the following season with Jim Joel's Royal Palace. The split with Merlis cost Piggott's victories in three classics, but by that time, O'Brien's unparalleled skills were clearly evident. He only had to wait 12 months for the upcoming of Sir Ivor. Having again chosen correctly, having chosen correctly, Pectino, trained by Susan's father, was available. Piggott and Sir Ivor were simply majestic. Sir Ivor showed rare flair in the 2000 guineas before his jockey nursed the Colts' suspect stamina to an exquisite derby triumph. Later that... Later in that year, Sir Ivor was sent to America for the Washington, D.C. International run on desperately testing ground. Piggott, at his brilliant best, conjured a dazzling late burst from his partner to set down the leader in the dying, in the dying strides. British race scorers had witnessed this late thrust of Piggott's and had almost come to expect of him. For the Americans, however, the tactics were as foreign as the man to employ them. The press were scathing, particularly with the writer's offhand way. The one pressman asked him at what one pressman asked him at what stage he thought he was going to win the race, to which Piggott replied, About three weeks ago, when they decided to send me the horse. About three weeks ago, when they decided to send the horse over, as if to silence his American critics, Piggott rode Carabas to win the same race 12 months later. The same year, Nandinsky outclassed his two-year-old contemporaries in a five-race winning streak. Nandinsky is one of only a few thoroughbreds whose name has spread beyond the boundaries of the turf. He was the most imposing horse to look at, a handsome beast blessed with the, an ability to quicken at the end of his races. In 1970, the Dark Bay Colt waltzed away with racing's triple crown, a feat as yet unmatched since his imperious reign. Yet it was O'Brien's unique talents as a trainer, coupled with Piggott's finesse, that allowed the horse to display the full range of his talent. In lesser hands, the nervous fretful Najinsky might never have made it to the races. He might have made up one of the hundreds of thoroughbreds, depressingly unable to reach the track. Two years later, it was Roberto's turn. His last gasp derby victory after Piggott played his customary game of musical saddles to gain the ride heralded a fickle reception from the public, never before or since. Has a derby winner been booed in the aftermath as Piggott was on unsaddling the colt? Irrespective of the fact that he had ridden one of his finest, most forceful finishes, the crowd felt that he had gone too far. They found the moment when they were looking for when Bill Williamson, who Piggott replaced on Roberto, rode a winner later in the day. The applause was rapturous. Emperly landed Piggott's seventh derby in 1976, but the minstrel's victories the following year signified a shifting balance of power 
within horse racing. Previously, jockeys were treated very much like upgraded stable lads. They earned their riding fee plus the sum of a small retaining salary and precious little else. But the minstrel's owner, Robert Stankster, did not take the landed gentry approach to racehorse ownership. He gave his retained jockeys a share in those horses retiring to stud. No mean deal considering what Sangster was to do with the value of blood stock during his unchallenged blitz of the scene. If Stangster was the instigator of such an arrangement, it was entirely fitting that Piggott was the first recipient. Jockeys were to become rich men indeed, a fact that no doubt helped to prompt Piggott's uncharacteristic dancing on the tables at Annabelle's nightclub in London after the minstrel's victory. The duel arc du trophée success of alleged were among the last enjoyed by the O'Brien Piggott partnership. O'Brien's influence diminished with the onslaught of Middle Eastern patronage of British stables. Even in the face of Stankster's spirited opposition, as with many before him, O'Brien considered Piggott's skills to be on a different level. And like many before him, O'Brien was never more anxious than when Piggott usually forbidden from riding horses and their homework, would arrive to put the classic hopes through their paces early in the year. The trainer concerns himself solely with bringing a horse to a peak on a given day. He guides the horse along slowly so that it is never asked to undertake homework at anything like racing pace. Piggott, for his part, set horses extremely stiff tests at home totally against the trainer's wishes the reason well he needed to know how good the horse was likely to prove and the slightest doubt would see him scanning the horizon for a more attractive big race prospect the early 1980s saw piggott turn full circle he was back at warren place riding for merlis's son-in-law henry cecil who married merlis's daughter julie Tina So hoisted Piggott's Derby tally to nine in 1983, but the following year, Piggott burnt his bridges with the temptuous art dealer Daniel Weidenstein at Paris-based Pardon of Cecil, who embraced and rejected Britain's finest jockeys at one stage or another. The Cecil retainer was over, but not before Piggott's financial dealings brought racing into disrepute over the terms of his contract. All retrainer fees have to be lodged with the jockey club, racing's ruling body. Piggott's was registered at £10,000, but Cecil sent out letters to all his owners stating that, in addition, Piggott was to be paid an extra £45,000 in cash, along with other fees over and above the standard writing percentages. Scam was exposed by a disgruntled owner, and embarrassingly, one of Cecil's patrons was none other than the jockey club senior steward of the day, Lord Howard D. Walton. Piggott retired from the saddle in 1985 to take up a training career. He had made a fair start before his world collapsed around him. Even after he was advised to reveal the workings of a network of bank accounts, he refused to cooperate with a tax investigation against him. The inspector's late detection of 17 undisclosed accounts worth more than £2 million meant a spell in prison, but was a foregone conclusion. He served a year of his three-year term. However, just as he seemed destined to while away the years at his new market home, the racing world was sent reeling when Piggott announced he was to return to the saddle at age 54. Within a few weeks, he was at it again, gallivishing Royal Academy to a quite stunning victory in the 1 million Breeders' Cup mile at Belmont Park in New York in 1990. The 1992 season saw him forge the link with Sangster, whose fine colt Rodrigo de Triano 
possessed the talent for Piggott to be seen at his daring best, but late in the year, the 56-year-old jockey was wildly thrown from Mr. Brooks in a race at Gulfstream Park. His frail body prostrate on the dirt surface. He had had his share of the inevitable falls, but the gods had been kind to him thus far. This tumble, however, looked different. With the world awaiting news of his injuries, Piggott retained Piggott regained consciousness and had sustained broken collarbone and two cracked ribs, and his instant reaction was that he would be riding again in a few weeks. News of Piggott's fall made the front pages in America, a country only days away from the Bush-Clinton presidential election, and the Queen sent her own get-well-soon message delivered by the British Council in Florida, where Piggott was recuperating. For all his roguish habits, Piggott was adored by generations of seasoned racegoers and novices alike. His was a shoot-from-the-hip existence. His latest maneuvering, bringing a knowing smile to all but the second party, there was a raffish charm about him which made it difficult for anyone to bear grudges for too long. And there were moments when his natural generosity broke through from the rigid cash-collecting mentality ingrained in him by his mother. But the Pickett story has his obsession with money as its central theme, the essence of its existence. The legend in his writing days had it he was the best and that he was justified in touting his services as a result. Such thinking does not allow for the theme of generosity to sit alongside it. The public wanted Piggott, the gunslinger, riding in and out of town to have the sort of ability he had his only half the equation. The other is difficult. It requires the dedication and commitment to harness that ability. Piggott had both these in equal measure, and the turf will write many chapters before it can record one of equal writing prowess. As for the legend, it must stand alone. Never again will there be born a man of such magnitude, such as a complicated genetic mix. It was an intense passion, a ruthless dedication, a glittering career. It was bold, brash, and brilliant. It was simply Lester Piggott. He is survived by partner Barbara Fitzgerald, Susan, and their daughters, Maureen and Tracy, and his son, Jamie, by his former assistant, Ann Ludlow. That was actually really great writing. I, I enjoyed, uh, I, well, I should say this. I don't enjoy reading out loud, but I did enjoy reading the article. I think it gave a lot of insight into the background of what's going on in horse racing, the behind the scenes, if you will. And I think a lot of times that's actually missing from a lot of sports is that we're only seeing uh, the the surface and we're not seeing what's below it. And so that that's why I, I really enjoyed this. Uh, we, we're getting little details that we would often miss otherwise. Um, if you guys uh, have anything to say about Lester Piggott or if you have any cards of his, let me know what you think about the article or Lester Piggott. I... Um, I read a little bit more into his uh, his financial escapades, if you will, and it's outlandish. It really is. Uh, how did these guys thought that they could get away with this? Even Lester Piggott. Um, but his cards are pretty expensive. I'm not going to lie. I, I paid about $30 for this particular card, which is actually really cheap. Um, and he doesn't like, have a whole lot of cards to begin with. So uh, his career was pretty long considering that he only has like maybe 10 cards if that i'm probably being uh, very liberal on, on that statement too um the the 1959 barrett is uh it, it's a set i think that it has a lot of great potential uh there is a few other cards that i'd love to get my my mitts on my collecting mitts but uh you know the, the one thing i i i like about collecting uh, cards from overseas, and the one thing I don't like about it at the same time is that, again, they're overseas cards, and most, the majority of these cards are not 
here. They're, they're really kind of unattainable. The only way that you're going to really kind of grab these cards is, you know, either uh, going over to England or Great Britain or having them sent over here. Now, the problem with a lot of cards being sent from Great Britain to the United States is they're not packaged correctly. Um, these, uh, these guys and girls who are selling these cards over there, they don't quite understand what the, the value of these cards really are and kind of like how uh, that they should be protected as they're in their uh, folders or their envelopes. And so I always I always have a, 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 a huge complaint when it comes to the dealers from Great Britain. Um, they don't maybe not have the supplies. They probably don't have the supplies that they need to uh, protect these cards. Usually I find them in and just really ab abhorrent conditions. And a lot of these cards are, you know, 50, 60, up to 100 plus years old. So um, the the condition which you may find your card, uh, and when you open up the package, I always pray to the cardboard gods when I open these things up because I don't know what kind of condition they're in. And it makes me very nervous. On the same account though, uh, the uh, the cards from Great Britain is a really a untapped resource for a education and b trying to uh, to gain players that might not have had the opportunities to have a card in the United States like the majority of jockeys and as I said before uh, I'm going to talk more about uh, the horse racing and baseball connection because I think it's very important and it, it kind of opens a, a door to uh, or a window to what's going on in American society between, say, 1902 and 1940, and I think it's a really interesting read. So I'm gonna I'm gonna get into that in another video. But again, guys, thank you for so much for stopping by. I greatly appreciate it as always. This was kind of a long read, to tell you the truth, and I I don't really enjoy reading stuff out loud to begin with. Um, I'm not really suited for, for that. But um, I'm not really doing it for me. I'm doing this for you guys so that you guys can have a better way of or a better understanding of what is going on in sports and society and history and, and everything associated with sports cards. So it's it's more for your benefit than it is for mine, although I, I don't like this medium right here and I, I don't like to read out loud. Um, they say, you know, uh, if, if you uh, practice long enough, you can really kind of do anything. I, I've been at this now for over a year, and I still am not to where I, I feel comfortable in this. But I'm still going to continue, as, as always, and it's not going to stop me. Um, and so, again, it's not for me. It's, this is for you guys. And uh, I, I really kind of hope that you guys would, would enjoy uh, reading or listening to what I have to say here. So again, guys, thank you so much for stopping by. I greatly appreciate it, as always. If uh, you have any stories about Lester Piggott or uh, his cards, let me know, because I, I always uh, want to hear what you guys have to say. And until the next time, I will talk to you later. Have a good one. Bye.